Muy buenas tardes. Un saludo allá al misionero Miguel Bermúdez Marín. Good afternoon. Greetings to the missionary Miguel Bermúdez Marín, his wife Ruth, and all the brethren that accompany him in Valparaíso, Chile. In the congregation that the Reverend Sergio Aguilar Dueñas pastors, and all the brethren gathered there, and all those who are connected through the satellite Amazonas or Internet on this occasion, today, Friday, October 27th of this year, 2023. Let us search in our Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verse 15 and on, where he tells us, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Obeying the voice of the one sent at each time, That is the subject that we will be seeing and listening to. Preach on May 15, 2016, here in Calle, Puerto Rico. It was the message that he preached that Sunday. On Friday, he had already given the introduction, which is the subject we were listening to last Friday. And today, we will be seeing this message under the same subject, obeying the voice of the one sent at each time. You may please be seated. In the message, God is among his people, which was preached on November 10, 2002, in Lo Prado, Chile. He tells us, the mystery of that name, which is the mystery of the name of God, will be, Christ will write it upon the overcomer, and the overcomer for the last day will be the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The mystery of the name of God will be there. Where is the mystery of the name of God? In the angel, in the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of the name of the city of our God and of the new name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Christ is the one who says that he will write it on the overcomer. Remember that the name was in the Angel of the Covenant, in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, the name is in the Angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, there will be a prophet messenger who will obtain the great victory in divine love at the last day. And so he will be the one who will be adopted and his group with him. Notice, none of the seven angel messengers were adopted, nor was the group. But in this end time, through that prophet messenger who will obtain the great victory in divine love and his group, well, therefore, They will obtain the promise of their adoption, of their transformation of their bodies. He goes on to say, And the overcomer is the first one who receives and eats of that food, and he shares it with all the people of God, in the midst of whom Christ, in Holy Spirit, will be manifested through his angel messenger in this end time. Remember, that each messenger in each age was the Holy Spirit through that instrument. It was the angel of the Lord through that instrument. Therefore, they become messengers of God in whom the ministry pertaining to that age was operated 
in a portion. As it was manifested through each angel messenger in each age. And I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. In the book of the ages, he tells us. Let us see here. Page 317. Let us see. I'm going to be reading from the book, the red book. It is 356 in this one, but it is the book in Spanish. But just before that, on 355 of this same book, but let us look in page 317 in English. He tells us, the bride goes wherever the bridegroom is. She will never be left by him. She will never leave his side. She will share the throne with him. She will be crowned with his glory and honor. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. And what is the name of God? Well, he was God with us. Or Emmanuel. But that was not his given name. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And here, in that book, on page 355, he writes, J-H-W-H. And he also writes there at the bottom, Y-H-W-H. Luke 1.31. Jesus said, I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. Therefore, the name of God is Jesus, for that is the name he came in. He is Lord Jesus Christ. And what name does a woman take when she marries the man? She takes his name. It will be his name that is given unto the bride when he takes her to himself. And let us turn to page 318, which in Spanish should be 360. It says, Yes, we can do all of that, Yet we can only know an infinitesimal part of it until it becomes reality in the first resurrection. And I will write my new name upon him, my new name. When all becomes new, then he will take upon his a new name, and that name will be the name of the bride also. What that name is, none dare conjecture. It will have to be a revelation of the Spirit given so conclusively that none would dare deny it. And there in that book, on that page 356, there he writes, there he draws a cornerstone and the ages and an arrow from where he says it would have to be a revelation. There from that sentence, an arrow comes out toward the cornerstone. But no doubt he will leave that revelation to the day when he desires to give that name forth. 
Suffice is to know that it will be more wonderful than we could ever imagine. And there he writes, everything new. He also wrote that there. And also on the book on 356, he also writes, new name, Y-H-W-H. And on page 211, which in this two Spanish book is 232 and 230, 230 and 231, there on the book on the red one is 230, English 211. And today each one of us through believers had had a change in name. We are Christians. He writes, name dispensation. It is a name common to all of us, but one day we will have another change. We will of a certainty receive a new name. And he writes, in the adoption of the Father. It could well be that name was our true and original name written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. He knows the name, but we do not. One day, and he writes, eighth day, at his good pleasure, we will know also. And there beside it, he writes, every child comes in the name of his father. Our brother William continues to say here, therefore, there will be no conjectures of scholars in theology who can discover or obtain the knowledge of that name. It will only be known by the one who receives it, and the one who receives it is the overcomer, the one upon whom Christ writes it. The little white stone is Christ in his second coming. He is the cornerstone. He is the stone that the builders rejected in his first coming when he became flesh. In the message, the living word preached on May 7th, Saturday, May 7th, 2005, in Santiago, Chile, he tells us, how does the divine revelation come in order to know the interpretation of the word? Through the living word in the messenger pertaining to each age. That is how the promised word for each age is revealed, is open to bring forth that for which is sent for. That is why you cannot add or take away from the word in each age and in each dispensation. And in this dispensation of the kingdom, everything that is being spoken for the chosen ones to obtain that rapture in faith, one cannot add to it nor take away from that word. As God is given it, that is how they the ministers who have been faithful in the ministry pass it on to the people so that it produces all that teaching that is being given through the fulfillment of the tent vision in a great tent cathedral so that it makes the effect on those chosen ones that are receiving that word that they need to thus obtain the adoption, the transformation of their bodies. And Brother William says, and now let us read this here. It says, and there he quotes page 125 in the book of quotations. Let us look it up to have it, to read the writings on page 125, paragraph 1110. It says, He only reads one part. Let's read that part. He says, We could pick it, pick it up, and everything else there, but it's got to be revealed. In order to reveal, Moses had to become God to the people. Moses was the living word veiled then. The people saw that pillar of fire, said, Now we are satisfied, see? Let Moses speak, see? 
Don't let God speak, lest we die. Moses walked right into that pillar of fire. See? And he writes there, Moses had to become God. And there the writings, they're in the part above. But also here, there where he says or he writes, for the first dispensation equals Moses, for the second dispensation equals Jesus. And he writes, Moses speaks, and he also writes, the third dispensation, and a question mark. He didn't put no name there. And he writes, adapted. Now notice how in the third dispensation, which is the dispensation of the kingdom, of the last three, well, it is the dispensation of the kingdom, which is the seventh. There is where the overcomer, that messenger, will be reaching the adoption and together with him, the group, so thus to obtain the great victory in divine love. The victory in divine love is obtained, that is, a victory is obtained in a battle. In other words, in a war. A victory is obtained in war. Therefore, that instrument has to be on earth in that victory, which he will obtain through divine love. In other words, it is a victory in divine love. Now notice, he also says there, then paragraph 11.11 on this same page 125 says, the promised word to this age must also be veiled. That is there below it. And there he writes, The word of this age must be veiled. Now, in this drawing, something very important, and it is that he places an arrow as well. He places the arrow toward, he puts one, two, three, and four. And he puts the fourth one on the cornerstone and that drawing which he draws with the seven ages and the gap. And below the cornerstone, he also puts an arrow towards the gap part and then two more below. And he goes on to say there, he doesn't continue reading it, but notice what that excerpt goes on to say. Notice, seeing loving church members and sinners cannot see it because of the human veil. That's the reason they couldn't see him. And there he writes, the veil prevents from seeing the word in flesh. Our brother William continues saying, and what happens? Many people cannot see it because of the human veil where the word is carried. The veil is always the stumbling block for many people. Notice here it says in paragraph 11.13 it says, it says at the end of that paragraph it says, God veiled in human being blinded Israel. In other words, God veiled in Jesus. Notice, has ever blinded one, one it will blind, the other it will reveal the truth. It closes the eyes of some and opens the eyes of the others. And in that quote there he writes, it will blind some and open the eyes of others. He writes, the coming of Christ as well. And there on the top where it says, the Gentile church has also been blinded from the veil And he writes, the man, the flesh. Because God always uses an instrument, a veil of flesh. And he is always a cause for stumbling. And at the bottom he writes, by the veil, he will blind some and open the eyes of others. And Brother William continues saying, 
the word veiled and revealed through the veil of flesh where it is veiled blinds some, closes the eyes of some and opens the eyes of others. And now on page 168 on that paragraph 1502, let us look for that page to have it here as well. Brother William says, he quotes it and reads it. Now remember, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet, not to the theologians, the prophet. He is a reflector of God's word. He can't say nothing that is the prophet. He can't say his own thoughts. That is, he cannot speak according to his own ideas. He can only speak what God reveals. And in that quote, he writes there. Above he writes, a prophet is the word of God incarnate for his age. And he also writes, the prophet equals a reflector of the word. The word comes to them. And there also at the bottom he writes, Ah, let us continue here. On that same paragraph, he didn't read that little part there, he says. Even to the prophet Balaam, when he was tried to be sold, sell his rights, he said, how can any prophet say anything but what God puts in his mouth? It is a thing that God does that you can't say nothing else, and you're born that way. But nobody says before a prophet because he was absolutely the word of God. And he writes, Word. He was that Word in his day. You see God reflect. And there he draws a cornerstone and the ages. And where he said, He was the Word in his, there an arrow toward the cornerstone. And he writes, No one judges a prophet. And he continues saying, In other words, what God reveals to a prophet is what he speaks. He cannot begin to make up trying to invent his own interpretation. The divine revelation must come directly from God. And when he speaks that revealed word, what is he saying? What is the people listening to? The living word of God that was veiled in that messenger. And then through that messenger was revealed to the people. In the message, the mystery is enclosed in the seventh seal. Our brother William tells us there, which was preached on February 14th, 1998 in Fusagasuga, Colombia. He says, John got the fathers ready for Jesus to welcome the children into the fold. Now, this prophet upon whom the spirit of Elijah falls will prepare the children to welcome back Jesus. Brother William says, but there are people who do not know what they are looking for, nor what is promised to come. How are they going to welcome Jesus if they do not know how he will come? One is required to know the message of the forerunner and to know how he said he would come. He will come on a snow-white horse, and he will be from the west, because from the west will come a rider on a white horse, and he will be completely, fully the Emmanuel, the Word of God incarnate in a man. And those who stumble over that veil of flesh, well, they will not be welcoming the one who comes in that veil of flesh. And those who do not stumble but receive him and receive his message will be welcoming the one who is coming in that veil of flesh. See how simple everything is? Now, look in the message. The mighty God unveiled before us tells us on page 19. It says, and we find out here that God has always had skin on him. 
When Moses seen him, he had skin on him, looked like a man. When God was behind the curtains, he had skin on him. And God tonight in his church is veiled in his church with skin on it. He's still the same God tonight. We find that. And he writes, God with a veil of flesh. But now, as ever, the skin veil is what catches the traditions. They just can't believe that that is God making them people act like that. And there he writes, they stumble over the veil of flesh. See, it's because God is veiled in his church in skin, skin on it. That's right. He is hid from the unbeliever and revealed to the believer. Yes, sir. That is, notice, it is hidden. That is why we read there, he will blind the eyes of some and open the eyes of others. Some will not be welcoming him, but others will indeed be welcoming him. Why? Because it is revealed to them. To whom? To the chosen ones. To those who will be transformed. In other words, a person in this end time who will be transformed and raptured is a person who will be welcoming the Lord. Yes, sir. Now, when their tradition veil of tradition of the elders and the word is broke through, oh, of course, today then comes in plain view. We see him, deity again veiled in human flesh. And he writes, veiled deity. Hebrews 1 said so, and also Genesis 18. You remember, God was a man stand there eating and talking with Abraham and told what Sarah was doing in the tent behind it. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Deity veiled again in human flesh. And he draws a cornerstone and the last four ages there. Now remember, Jesus didn't say, when the Son of God is being revealed. In Luke, the 17th chapter, I believe in about the 20th or 21st verse, somewhere along there, he said, and when the Son of Man is being revealed, the Son of Man, back in the church again, revealed in human beings, not the Son of God, but the Son of Man again, back in his church again in the last days. We find that he promised that is God's promises. We notice another thing in the Old Testament. I have the scripture here in Exodus that the old badger skins, what did it do? It hid the glory of God from the people. The badger skins, even people couldn't see it because it was a skin that held it. The skin the glory of God was behind the skin. And now, the glory of God is behind your skin. That's right. And the traditions don't see it. It's inside the veil where his word was. And he writes, the glory of God hidden by the veil. And he writes, Revelation 10, 8 to 11. And 11, verse 3. Notice the coming of the mighty angel there. And notice those ministries of Moses and Elisha. What was on the inside of that skin back there? The old badger skin? Which, there was no beauty, we should desire it. And when it was made flesh and dwelt among us, it was still no beauty, we should desire it. And now the same thing is today. There's nothing in a man or a woman that can be desired. It's what's in behind there. That's what it is. And he writes, what is behind the veil is what is important. Well, you say, that fellow, I know he used to be a drunkard. He used to do this. I don't care what he used to do. What's hid behind that skin? What is behind there, that's what counts. That's what the people is blinded. 
The skin blinds the people, see? They say, I remember when that woman used to. Now notice. And right there, that next sentence says, I know what she used to, but what about now? See? Them skin that was once on the badger, but now it's hiding the glory of God. Got it housed behind it. It was on an animal, but now it's housing the glory of God. Our brother William continues saying, they will be welcoming the white horse rider of Revelation 19, who would come in a man of this end time. And, as we say here in Puerto Rico, a rooster doesn't crow any clearer. Someone else doesn't have to come to interpret that. It is already interpreted. And how is it interpreted? How is that white horse rider of Revelation 19 going to come? He would come in a man in this end time. And we can repeat what he said there. A rooster doesn't crow any clearer. In the message, the duality of the second Adam, the great mystery of Christ and his church, preached on August 12, 2010 in San Luis Potosí, Mexico. He tells us, The disciples say, increase our faith. Faith comes by hearing, and by hearing, the word. And faith increases by hearing. Therefore, take advantage by increasing your faith. Do you want God to increase your faith? Then, word upon word, so that your faith increases, because faith is revelation, and thus faith grows as the revelation comes. So, your faith cells starts multiplying, and then you have a greater faith. Your faith grows. Just like cell multiply with food, they grow, cell after cell. If you stop eating, then there are no cells that can multiply. The ones you have die off, and life is over. But if you eat, then the cells start multiplying, growing. The cell gets stronger with food. Take advantage of the time so that in this way we are prepared. When this mystery that you had for me here, the duality of the second Adam, the great mystery of Christ and his church, that mystery is going to be open under the seventh seal. It is tied to the seventh seal. It is tied to the whole program of God pertaining to this end time. Therefore, Pray a lot for those blessings that God has promised and be attentive, listening to the Word, so that when the mystery is open, you don't stumble. Notice since when he was saying to be searching, to be reading, to be listening to the message so that that faith would grow, so that God would continue to open your understanding, so that when that word is being fulfilled in the midst of the church, you do not stumble. Because he who is not prepared always stumbles. That's what Brother William says there. Now notice in the message, trying to do a service without being the will of God, on page 7. The Reverend William Branham tells us. On page 7 it says, God is sovereign. And we see here what David did. In the scripture reading of First Chronicles 13. And he, his intentions were good. But God does not give us merits on good intentions. There is only one way to serve God. That's by doing His will at His command. In God being sovereign, there is no one to tell Him what to do or how to do it. You cannot just say, this one, look at what he's doing. He shouldn't do that. He shouldn't do the other. And who are you? Or do you think you're God? In other words, you cannot 
bypass the order established by God on his program. God has always had an instrument, a prophet messenger, in the midst of the people through whom he works and fulfills what he promised. And as that prophet speaks, that is how things are fulfilled and will be fulfilled later on. In other words, what he speaks, God backs up all that word. He does it the way. He knows the right way to do it. And that makes me feel good. And it ought to make us all feel good. And I'm sure it does. For one would have it coming this way. And one have it going that way. And one the other way. But one great thing again about God. He has not left us now without knowing what's the truth and how to do it. In other words, so that later on they're not saying, I didn't know. They didn't tell me anything. That was never talked about. How can they say such a thing if he didn't tell me anything? Or there was no teaching or preaching about this or that. No. God always warns the people. Before a judgment comes, God always warns before the divine judgment falls, whether it be upon people, group, nations, continents. There is always a warning. Because otherwise, look, this would happen. Notice, he wouldn't be just to punish us for something that we didn't know how it was going to be done. And then let us stumble into something. He is not that kind of a God. Notice how God first warns us and tells us how we should do things, how it should be done. He is not that kind of God. He is a God that speaks the word and expects his children to believe it. And therefore, he knows what's best and when to do it and how to do it. We have our ideas of it, but he knows. And then if he set up a system that what he's going to do and didn't tell us what was going to happen and how it was going to happen, then we, stumbling at it, we would be justified in our stumbling or trying to do something. Each one would be justified. But there's only one way. And that is his word. And there he writes, if he doesn't say what he's going to do and how, and we stumble, when he, God, does something, we would be justified. And he draws a star of David. Notice how he warns us first. He tells us how to do things. And what he expects is that his children believe him. That is why he warns things. He sends a warning before sending judgment. And he shakes you and tells you, wake up. Because what is going to come is something terrible. And we do not want that person, that individual, who is in the wrong path, to come to get the divine judgment. That is what the warning is for. That is why he calls you to repentance, to humble yourself and say, look, Lord, I was wrong. I didn't do this or that. Forgive me. I want to continue on your path. I want to receive the blessings. That is the right attitude. But not everyone is like that. Instead, when they hear that, the first thing they say, look, what that man has is hatred in his heart. What that man wants is for everyone to be lost. When truly, it is the love of God being expressed. Because otherwise, then he will send the divine judgment. And how is God going to judge you if he did not warn you? Then that word comes to fulfillment there. That we would be justified when we stumbled. But God is a just God. And God warns first before sending the divine judgment. Now, our brother William continues saying here, because he who is not prepared always stumbles. He who is prepared and whose faith is well strengthened, well increased, the only thing he will be able to say is, 
I expected it to be this way. In the message, the seventh seal and the third pool, which was preached on March 15, 1998, in Asunción, Paraguay, tells us, some people may stumble over simplicity, but Christ said, but blessed is he that does not stumble in me. That was for the first coming of Christ and also for the second coming of Christ because they stumbled back then over the veil of flesh where the first coming of Christ was being fulfilled. In other words, the coming of the angel of the covenant. And at the last day, some will also stumble over the veil of flesh, the angel of Jesus Christ, where the coming of the angel of the covenant of the angel that was very different from the rest will be fulfilled. In the message, Christ is the mystery of God revealed, on page 38, he tells us, page 38, he is quoting the scripture of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, he says, well, does not Hebrew the fourth chapter says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he was that word. And when that word is permanence in the man, the same thing takes place again, for it is the word. And he writes, the same thing happens. Amen. See how you can stumble over this from now on? There is so perfectly plain. See? All right. That's why they're blind. Same as it was in the days Christ was on the earth. Oh my. They staggered the same way. They said he was Belzebub. They seen he could do it. So they said, he was born an illegitimate child and kind of an odd fellow. He just got possessed with some devil. He's Samaritan over there and he's got a devil in him. That's how he does that. Jesus said, I forgive you for that. See, calling the word of God, the works of God, an evil spirit. He said, I'll forgive you for that. But someday the Holy Ghost will come and one word against it will never be forgiven, neither in this world or the world that is to come, or that great day. It will not be forgiven. So you see, and he writes there, the blasphemy. So you see, that's written plain in the scripture. So when people come to that day, and he writes, the eighth day, no matter how intellectual, and how big a denomination they belong to, it's condemned. They have to be. They've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Call it Holy Roller and something another that had an untasty name or something like that. And God's church had to bear it all the time. Now, what did you think? That at this time you were also going to get away with blaspheming and speaking and saying all kinds of name against the Word? The Word, the Holy Spirit incarnate? This is the eighth day. And this is the day that we must face all of this. But God, remember, is giving this warning. Let us see how many heed this warning. How many actually come to the feet of Christ with repentance. Come to the feet humbling themselves as that woman did. Notice that in this end time, God is giving that warning. And we should take it very, but very seriously. God is not playing around. This is not a game of what attack there and attack here. No, this is the word of God. This is the future of your life. And I'm talking to those who are written in the book of life because those are the ones who are at most risk of being blotted out. 
And remember that the third pool, since it is for the three groups, one has to be identifying, and when it's not identified, one already knows which group is being spoken to, because it is for the wise virgins, for the foolish, for the 144, and for the lost. All groups are covered by the teaching under the tent, and it will impact all of them. Notice, when the word is spoken, right away groups arise, that is, people, whether it's through different means, praising and glorifying God, glorifying His name, because they see themselves identified with that woman. I am referring to the message that we preached recently, in which we read from that message, Jesus with dirty feet, and many are still glorifying God, because despite the whole journey they have gone through in their lives, how God had mercy with them, and they are there identified as that woman, and they glorify God for the revival that God has given. But there is others who identified with Simon, with the Pharisee, because there are only two characters there, and there one can see, but they are supposed to be glorifying God as well. They are supposed to be happy and joyful, because they are seeing that woman there and identifying themselves with that woman. How can they not identify with her? Well, if they do not identify with her, who are they going to identify with? Well, with the Pharisee, with Simon, because there were only two people there. And there we are clearly seeing that segregation. And it is hard to say it. But it was promised that at the end of the world, God would send his reapers. God would be sending the ministers of Moses and Elijah to make that separation, that segregation. And now the people of God, the bride, is seeing it with their own eyes. They cannot stay quiet to pray to God and ask Him for guidance and for God to enlighten them. And since they do not identify themselves with that group of that woman, they then identify themselves with Simon. And it is very unfortunate what those people are going to receive. And it is spoken so that later on they do not say, no, nothing was said to me. Everything is being spoken. So that in this way, as he said there in that message, the mighty God unveiled, which we read. Afterwards, they cannot say that God did not warn them. God always warns so that when they stumble, then if God does not warn, then they would have to be justified. Now notice, he continues saying, even Paul, before Agrippa, said, in the way that's called heresy, which means crazy, that's the way our worship the God of our fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, because it was revealed to him what the great truth of Christ was. And today people say it's a denomination. Notice how Brother Branham was already speaking everything about how it would be at this end time. It is Jesus Christ, the new birth, revealed in you, that he has the preminences and he might express his word. And anything that he's promised in these last days, he can bring it to pass through his body as he's working. Amen. It's just exactly the word of God made manifest. Notice, all right, same as in the days of Christ, God holds the key to the revelation of Christ himself. Do you believe that? School of theology can never find it. Jesus said so. If you want to read it now in Matthew 11, 25 and 27, and he writes, the key. I thank thee, O Father, God of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid this from the eyes of the wise and prudent and revealed it to the babes such as would learn. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, 
and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Look at them, scholars of that day, those Jews, very fine men, their organizations of Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians, and whatever they might be. See? All their great organizations, and Jesus said, You're blind. You lead the blind. Well did Isaiah speak of you. You have ears and can't hear, and eyes that you can't see. Because Isaiah said this in the Spirit. Therefore the God of heaven has blinded your eyes. You're doing like Eve did. Accepting the intellectual side. And know nothing of the Spirit of God. Therefore, won't they all fall in the ditch? Both the leader as the blind too. And God alone holds this key. And he writes the key. He expressed the same thing in a previous scripture there a while ago when I read it, when he said, Who does man say I the Son of Man am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon, a son of Jonas. Flesh and blood never revealed this to you, my Father which is in heaven. Upon this revelation here alone, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will never prevail against it. See? Now you see. So, therefore, there is no school, no theologian, no teaching of the Bible among any school that knows anything about it. They can know nothing about it. It is impossible for them to know anything about it. God has hid the senses of knowing it from the very elect teachers and everything else. It is a personal, individual affair with the person. Remember that the elect of God is the one who has that prophetic insight. And one already knows who are the ones that have that prophetic insight. They are the ones who welcome the white horse rider of Revelation 19. That Christ is revealed to them. And if you say, He being revealed to me, and then the life that Christ produced here in the Bible, that same life is in Him, does not produce itself in you, then you've got the wrong revelation. If I put a life of a pumpkin into the life of a pear tree, it would bear pumpkins by their fruits. You shall know them. And he writes, If he has revealed himself to you. Now notice. On page 35, he also tells us a little part there. He says, But by the revelation that God has revealed the Word to you, He is the Word. And the Word, how you know it's revealed, it leaves itself and expresses Himself through you. Hmm? Churches has long forgotten that great revelation. That's right. Revelation of the truth. They have forgotten it. And he writes, the revealed word. Now our brother William continues saying, But blessed is he that find no stumbling in him, in the veil of flesh in which God will be fulfilling his purpose of this last day, and where the seventh seal will be manifested, where the angel of the covenant will be manifested, where the angel who was different from the rest will be manifested in human flesh. Notice, these are very, but very important words here. He is speaking to you, and I am repeating them at this moment, so that you know what is behind the veil. And do not stumble. Do not heed yourself on and against the stone. Let me read this again so that you are aware of who is behind the veil. But blessed is he that find no stumbling in him in the veil of flesh in which God will be fulfilling his purpose of this last day and where the seventh seal will be manifested, where the angel of the covenant will be manifested, where the angel who was different from the rest will be manifested in human flesh. 
and that is the coming of the Word in human flesh. It will be the Word incarnate in a man. Page 303 in the Book of the Seals. But when our Lord appears here on earth, He'll be riding on a snow-white horse, and He'll be completely fully the Emmanuel, the Word of God incarnate in a man. He continues saying, and through that man, the third pool manifested in the end time. On page 139 in the Book of the Seals, he tells us, But think now. Let us see here. A bit further down, he says, they never uttered for nothing because he comes talking about, he's saying to John, John, don't write it down. I will reveal this when they have the need to know it. He says, let's read it here. It says, there is something other. But I imagine when the mysteries begin to come forth, God said, hold it back now. Wait a minute. I'll reveal it in that day. Don't write it at all, John, because they'll stagger over it. Just let it go, see? But I'll reveal it in that day. And he writes, eighth day. I'll reveal it in that day when it has need to be done. They never utter it for nothing. Remember, like the little drop of ink. Everything is for a purpose. Everything is for a cause. But notice, the Creator uttered. And he heard this voice and he went to see. But now the Lamb is showing John in a symbol of a church scripture, like for the church to know what to write. He just showed him, said, don't, don't tell this just w what it is. Don't go down, John, and say, no, this is just what this is, or what's under this seventh seal. Don't, don't go down and tell that. For if I tell John that, then all down through the age, the whole plan will be broke. It's a secret, see? He just wants his coming, he said now. And anybody is going to know when I'm coming. I'm just coming, see? See, that's all. It ain't for my business to know when. I'll just be ready, you see? Which was the same thing Brother William said there in that message. So that when that mystery is here and is open, in other words, when that mystery of the seventh seal is fulfilled, you do not stumble. In other words, the believer must be watching and be prepared. On page 565, he also tells us there, he says, I'm sure you noticed that little Collins boy laying there dying the other night. That little leukemia girl. The kingdom of God is coming. And he writes, dispensation of the kingdom. And it's becoming more from the negative to the positive. The seven ages with their angels. And he writes, the morning star. That is the second coming of the Lord. As it has been now. That out to choke people. From justification to sanctification. To the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then here, here, and he writes, the coming of the Lord, the seventh seal. We're just drawing closer to God all the time. Our brother William continues saying, now, did you see how God will be working in this end time? Through the word incarnate in a man. Through the word incarnate in a man, will come the third pool in its different faces, both for the church bride as well as for the foolish virgins and also for the lost. In the message, The Power of Transformation, preached on August 19 of 2011, it tells us, it was preached on San Luis Potosí, Mexico, and it says, how does the word come? He would do nothing without first revealing his secrets to his servants, his prophets. 
For each time God brings His Word to a man, that man receives it from God. It becomes flesh in him, and he begins to speak that Word, and it becomes flesh in the people who hear it. And what begins? The Word of God. That is the Word of God. Everything that is being spoken begins to become materialized. And what had been spoken for other times, or in other times, but was not fulfilled in those times, then it is fulfilled in that time, because there is a spoken word. And let us say, this word was spoken in other times for our time, from Genesis to Revelation. Therefore, the word that is spoken to be fulfilled at a certain time, what was spoken is going to be materialized around that word. And if it was spoken to certain people that God is going to give them such a blessing, then first they will hear that word, they will believe it, and they will conquer that promise by faith, believing it. And that is how the word becomes flesh in the person. And then since it became flesh, around that word that became flesh, the fulfillment of that promise will be materialized. What we said about that quote from Brother Branham, that Abraham and Sarah were rejuvenated around that word. Therefore, it will become a work of faith, a work of faith in the person, in the people of God. And not only what happens in the person, but what happens in the church as a mystical body of believers. The whole work of God will be carried out around the word that has been spoken for his church for that stage, for that age, for that time. And things that God said he would do, or he will do or will be seen in the church, are none other than the materialization of what God said that will happen. All those things are the divine thought spoken, expressed by the Holy Spirit through the instrument that he sends to his people. And one of the things that would be happening, which was prophesied, that would come in the midst of the church, both to the individual as to the mystical body of believers, in the stage of the age of the cornerstone, is also the days of Ananias and Sapphira. Notice in the message, God judges the heart, which was preached back then in 1977, 1976, let me correct, December 26, going into 1977. Notice, it was a message in which we were reaching that divine cycle where after that God would be fulfilling the divine judgments. Remember that everything was represented, typified in that time, which we then see that apparently it did not happen in 77. And God opened a stage there in which he would be calling and gathering those who would be part, those living stones, parts of the most holy place, because the most holy place was not built yet. Therefore, that time would be open, because notice, by that time, the call to take the book had already been made, but no one appeared. He could not leave the throne of intercession until the last elect came in. That is, until that last one belonging to the age of the cornerstone came in. Now, after that call is made and throughout that time, all those people are gathered. Then once it is full, it says, they draw it out to the shore. And there they gather the good in baskets and cast the bad away. In other words, after that gathering comes a separation, a segregation, which is what is taking place in this end time. Notice how the cycle repeats itself again, of that time there from 74 to 77, which went into those three and a half years back then. And notice in this message, on page 
58, which they prepare like a volume of the glorious reward, I will only read some parts. Notice he says, Now, we know that the Lord himself will be on this earth literally. Also, the Archangel Michael and the Archangel Gabriel will be here as well. They will be working from their dimension through this dimension. Well, their armies will also be there. Their armies will also be moving and working in everything. So, it will be a great meeting of the heavenly armies to face what? To face the devil who will ride the pale horse and who will come to destroy the people of God. So, the battle is fierce, but we do know the end, right from the beginning. Whose side are you on? That's the important thing. That's the important thing, what side you're on. So, it is a guaranteed battle, although hard, it is going to be hard. The battle will roar. It is the greatest battle ever fought. It is the same one fought in heaven that comes to be fought here on earth at this end time. It is the greatest battle ever fought, but it is the greater victory ever achieved because it is the victory of divine love. And there it is, see? With what there was in past ages, only a partial battle could be fought. But here in the age of the cornerstone, the age of divine love, and we have what to fight that battle with, see? So you won't have to roll up your sleeves against anyone. That battle will be fought and will be won in divine love. The devil and anything else will be conquered with divine love. That is the only thing that can conquer the devil. It is the only thing that can overcome him. It is the only thing that can overcome the false anointed ones. It is the only thing that can conquer all falsehood. So, see? Remember that love is corrective. I don't know if in the book of quotations there is an excerpt where he talks about that. And there is a message that he has marked where he puts that love is corrective. In other words, because of the love that God has for his children, many times we get, let us say, beaten in different ways, both spiritual and physical, to straighten out a child of God because God loves us and what God wants is for us to obtain the blessings. See, so there is no need to be afraid. There is only one thing to do, and that is, buckle up. All these years we have been speaking about the things that God has spoken in His Word. This coming year we will be living in our own flesh, experiencing what it is written there, and has been known to us, and which we have heard, see? Now the time is coming to experience it literally. How are you? How do you feel? Do you feel strong spiritually speaking? Do you feel full of vigor, full of strength? Do you feel like saying, I can do all things through Christ who straightens me? If you feel that way, then be prepared, be ready. Because at any moment, the trumpet is going to sound. And a trumpet declares war, spiritual war. A trumpet sounds, a message goes forth, and a spiritual war breaks out. There we are. The trumpet is well tuned. We know very well what has to come out of that trumpet. The message of the kingdom. That is how it was in past ages. A trumpet sounded. A message went forth. A messenger proclaimed it. And a spiritual battle unfolded. See? The elect were victorious. Although they departed, but went on to rest. And further on, on page 61 at the bottom, it says, that of Ananias and Sapphira is something that will happen. It is inevitable because it is said there. Now, someday, I'll explain to you how that is going to happen. How did that of Ananias and Sapphira happen back then? How did the spoken word come for it to happen? Who was it? Well, it was a type of Moses and Elijah. See? So, one of the three who went up there, one was in that position. 
and he could speak the word and bring judgment. And notice, that was at the beginning. Now we're at the end. He brought partial judgment. Now it will be worldwide judgment. But it has to move according to how it is promised. Now notice in the book of the seals, is where he says, on page 191, let us read to you that part, page 191, to leave it there as well, have that mark there, where it says, this is not the one that was marked I, I have to see if it's the other one but let us read it so you can have it he says no sir that's not right that's falsehood I do not hate women no sir they're my sisters if they are sisters but the thing is love is corrective if it isn't corrective it isn't love if it is then if it is love It's filial love and not agapao. I tell you that. They might have a little filial love for some nice-looking lady, but agapao love is a different thing. That's a love that straightens the things out and meet God yonder somewhere we can live eternally, see? I didn't mean that maybe in the way it sounded, but you know what I, I hope you understand, all right? Now notice how there he tells us that love is what? Love is corrective. The agapao love, not filial love, agapao love. Now notice, he continues saying here where we stopped, he says. And notice that was at the beginning, now we're at the end. He brought partial judgment. Now it will be world judgment but it has to move according to how it is promised. It's not about doing things without rhyme or reason. There is an order, and it is the Word, and one cannot step outside of that for things to be done. There will be things that will fill us with joy, with happiness, but there will also be things that will fill us with sadness. But what are you going to do? Look, remember that judgment begins at the house of God. Look, in that time of the Jewish church, back in the beginning, there were many things that filled the people with joy. But when the part about Ananias and Sapphira happened, it filled everyone with sadness. Do you think that Ananias and Sapphira, that couple, that marriage, were just anybody? No. They were important people in the midst of the brethren. They were people of a high economic status. They were people who worked in the work. They were very loved people. Look, notice, in the scripture, it doesn't tell us about just anyone. It tells us about people who had an important part in the history of the word. Just like that and in Korah. They weren't just anybody. They were important people. Judas wasn't just anybody. He was an important person, see? And so were Ananias and Sapphira. They were important people at that time. And further on, on page 64 says, Now, I don't know if Ananias and Sapphira got lost or not. That's between God and them. Who knows if they got lost or who knows if they didn't? They were part of the group, see? Now notice that this filled the people with sadness, but it also fulfilled them with fear reverential fear. They saw the authority that was there. They saw the leadership of God through a man. They saw the blessings of God, but they also saw the judgment of God. And everyone started walking more upright, and that is a blessing. And that is what I'm trying to avoid. If you are already being warned, if you are already being told, why do you have to come to this? Why do you have to come to this situation so that you can see that it is God who is in the midst of the people? What is better? 
that nothing happens and some walk crookedly or for the judgment to fall on some so that it is of a blessing for the rest? See? Now you say, it was good that happened back then. Well, and I ask you, what about today? When we are promised that the same thing will happen. But how will it happen? Will it happen literally or will it happen spiritually? That's another thing. Will that come with spiritual death or with literal death? Because he says that it's going to come. And that when it happens, then that is the beginning of something important. And I am going to tell you something at this moment. I know how it's going to come. It is going to be fulfilled spiritually and physically as well. There is no doubt about that. When something is happening, I will be showing you that that is part of what I'm talking to you today in this afternoon. Well, we know and hear these things, we are really filled with fear, but not to be afraid. We are not scaring anyone here. Let that be very clear to you. We are talking about reality here. But not to be afraid, but be filled with reverential fear. And I have mentioned several things since Monday. Several things that we spoken on that night. Little by little, God shows us the things that happened there regarding everything that would be happening at this end time. Because we want that when He sees our heart and He looks at our heart and He tells us through the message how He is seeing us. That is why in yesterday's message, some words that I recorded just this morning or at noon And I wanted to leave them there, but then they were uploaded, where ministers, brothers, sisters, brokenhearted and wholeheartedly repented, were sending me audios, written messages. They said, I did this, I did that, forgive me. I want my transformation. I want to obtain the rapturing faith. I want to continue to obtain, I want to continue obtaining the rapturing faith. I am standing hand in hand. I'm standing there. I identify myself with that woman and many things. Now, all of that, which what, what Julio Angel mentioned to me, that he remembers that his dad told him that Brother William said that those days would come back again where the people would be the people who would be transformed and raptured. And even since of that group, for sure there are some who perhaps did not understand well what was happening. But later they understood it. And they are standing there hand in hand. If it is a minister with his group, and if it is an elect among the people, well, he's starting hand in hand with the minister preparing himself for the transformation. And if he's from another section from the Book of Life and he has not been blotted out yet, notice, they come with their heart wholeheartedly repented. In other words, God sees the heart because God judges the heart and he sees that they are wrong. And God sees that and God moves to mercy and forgives them everything they have done and will be doing wholeheartedly because they see behind the veil, they see God work. And what they desire and request from God is mercy. And God will give them mercy. God is giving them mercy. God is extending mercy. How has He told you that you look You know that, see? Therefore, he looks inside and tells you how you are. He judges you and will also condemn many. Well, such is the judgment at this time. 
The last plague that fell upon Egypt before the Exodus was death, discerning the body of the Lord. Preaching 59, on page 9, it says, The last plague is spiritual death. The last plague that hits the church is spiritual death. So notice that before literal death comes, spiritual death comes. Spiritual death first, and then literal death. By this Gentile world and these Gentile kingdoms being destroyed, and then we will begin here in the millennium. And further on, page 66 at the bottom says, Well, God bless us this morning. God keep us and help us to never stumble over anything. I already warned you, we have seen many blessings, many glorious things. But when we also see the hand of the Lord in judgment, don't be scandalized. Rather have reverential fear. Do not shoot as we say here, no tire de la baqueta, which means do not shoot from the holster. You will harm yourself. Don't start talking, writing, or doing things foolishly because a person who can speak like that, it is as the wife of Job did. And he said, you have spoken like a foolish woman. In other words, you have to be careful about your tongue, about what you think, about what you write, and all those things. Because God sees all that and God judges the heart. It is better, as we say here, you look better when you keep quiet. And that is not to be taken as a joke. I am saying it seriously. Take God things seriously. Because later on, you cannot be justified because you have stumbled. Some people actually stumble because they have not been prepared to welcome the white horse rider. But those who are prepared, those whose faith has been increasing more and more each day, they welcome him and thus receive the blessings he comes with. He comes for his church. He comes to rapture her. He says, when that persecution comes, don't get scared. There is a light. It is the pillar of fire that's in the midst of the church that will take her, that will rapture her. She will not go through the tribulation. That is an excerpt from the book of quotations. Now, he goes on to say, I already warned you, we have seen many blessings, many glorious things, but when we also see the hand of the Lord in judgment, don't be scandalized, but rather have reverential fear. And if you're not lined up in those days, lined up then, lest God bring something unpleasant upon you, because judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Those who have been scandalized and will be scandalized these days by these things that God is bringing to us, well, they have already been warned and they are being warned again. And that is already exposing everything that Brother Branham was going to preach there. The serpent's trail how all those things are being fulfilled and are being materialized in a way that the people did not imagine that would happen. Because judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Did it start that way back in the days of the apostles? It started there. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Where then will the Gentiles, the Gentile world, this dispensation, this Gentile generation of Amorites appear? Yeah, because this is the Gentile generation that is typified by the Amorites. It is typified by the Sodomites and by those of Gomorrah. Then, 
Where will they appear? They will appear in the destruction. So judgment awaits them. But blessings await you. If you position yourself right to receive what God has, if you're not positioned right, then you already know that the judgment starts with us. So, if it starts with us, what will it be like when it comes forth for them, for the Gentiles, for the sinful world? So, we could say a lot about this, and it would be very difficult to say it. For these things, when you read them there, and you read what God said to Brother Branham, that those cases would come up, the case of Ananias and Sapphira, and you are yearning for it to come. But when you know that Ananias and Sapphira were part of the group, then you realize that there will be sadness, see? But it will be the beginning of a new phase. I don't know if you have noticed how it's been going from one phase to another. Now notice that something is happening in these days, which is telling us there that a phase will be about to begin. But since judgment begins at the house and the people have to be prepared for that other stage, then God sends a warning so that you do not receive the divine judgment, but instead receive the blessings, which is what we desire. In the Book of the Ages, on page 315, it tells us, in this book, is 356, the book in Spanish. In this other book, in Spanish also, donde dice Jesús vendrá, 352. it's 352. In the other one. And uh, we are in 315. Let us see, page 315, where it says, It is in the midst of a time of great trouble that Jesus comes, and with his coming there is a resurrection. Many are to come forth out of the dust and rise with those who are alive but waiting for his return. And this will be given crowns. Why? Because they are sons of God. They are kings with Him. They are reigning with Him. That is what the crown signifies. Reigning and ruling with the great King Himself. That is the promise to all who suffer with Him here on earth. All those who endured patiently knowing that God, the just judge, would reward them they who gave up all for him and committed all to him will sit down in his throne and share his glorious kingdom. Oh, we have a word for us all at this time. It is hold fast, persevere, don't give up. Put on the whole armor of God. Use every weapon He has given us. Use every gift at our disposal and look ahead with joy because we are going to be crowned by Him who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Obeying the voice of the one sent at each time. Let us stand and thus leave with us in this subject, obeying the voice of the one sent at each time, our dear brother and friend, Dr. William Soto Santiago.